The conference has been unmuted. The conference has been muted. Welcome to all who have joined us for today's webinar, Shifting to Third-Party Billing Practices for Public Health STD Services, Focus on Case Studies, Part 1, hosted by the National Coalition of STD Directors. Just to start, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we do have a, a large number of participants on today's call, but the lines are not muted. So if you have a little bit of background noise as a courtesy to everyone else on the line, if you would press star 6 to mute your line. Um, we will be taking questions through the chat function, um, so there's no reason to keep your line unmuted um, unless you prefer to. Um, the webinar is also being recorded, so details on accessing the audio on the slides will be circulated afterwards. The chat function is open throughout, um, so you may submit questions during the presenter's presentations, um, but we will have a Q&A section at the end um, after all the presenters have finished. 
Um, if you have any uh, questions and need technical assistance, you can call 800-843-9166 to reach tech support. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Bill Smith. The conference has been unmuted. The conference has been unmuted. And I'll go ahead and introduce Bill Smith, who's the Executive Director of the National Coalition of STD Directors in Washington, D.C. NCSD represents state, territorial, and large city health departments funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, to carry out STD prevention activities. NCSD promotes sexual health through a specific focus on preventing STDs, and its area of work involves policy, advocacy, promoting health equity, and technical assistance and capacity. Thank you so much, Ariana. Um, hello, everyone. This is Bill Smith, and uh, I just want to also thank all of you for joining us today. This is the first of two webinars um, that are somewhat repeats of some sessions that we did at the NCSD annual meeting last month uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are focused on highlighting uh, the resources that we have created in our billing and reimbursement work over the past year, and that Ariana uh, who you just heard from was our lead on. So I really want to also start by thanking Ariana for her amazing work on behalf of NCSD, putting together uh, the amazing publications that are currently online. I'll encourage those of you who haven't seen them to go to our website. They are on the front page. Um, and just thank you for your leadership, Ariana. So thank you. Uh, very briefly, NCSD um, is, is, I think, uh, quite proud of the leadership that we have been providing in talking about the importance of using billing and reimbursement as one way to diversify the uh, revenue for STD programs, and in particular the clinical resources that STD programs provide, and that all of us on the call know um, have been significantly cut back as a result of budget constraints and other resource issues. We do not here at NCSD believe that billing and reimbursement is the panacea for supporting the, safe, for supporting the safety net in its entirety, but we certainly do believe that billing and reimbursement is an important component to add additional revenue to public health programs more generally, but more specifically for the STD programs with whom we work day in and day out. Um, so again, I hope you will check out the resources that are on our website. You'll see in the coming year that we have a number of additional resources forthcoming that deal with billing and reimbursement in, in the public health STD setting. And of course, we will let you all know about those. Uh, finally, let me just uh, really thank um, our friends from the Multnomah Health Department and the Philadelphia STD Program and their partner at the Family Planning Council for being on the call today and for being two of our four guinea pigs in this first endeavor we've made into really looking, and under, looking at and understanding how billing and reimbursement works in STD clinical services. So I will stop there. And again, thanks to all of you for being on the call. And thanks to our partners uh, for their presentations today. Great. Thanks, Bill. And just for those of you who may have joined um, after we began the webinar, um, the lines are open. Um, so if you would please press star six to mute your line, that way we won't share any background noise. I now have the pleasure of introducing Shireen Formoji, who works for the Multnomah County Health Department as a program supervisor of the STD Clinic and Disease Intervention Services Program. She has 15 years experience in sexual and reproductive health care and public health as an assistant manager of Planned Parenthood, as a disease intervention specialist, and as a supervisor for Multnomah County. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shireen. Thank you, Ariana. Good morning. So I'm here in Portland, Oregon, which is part of um, Multnomah County in Oregon. And so, Ariana, you're going to set up the slides, and I should just say next. That's next. right. Yep. Okay. So go ahead, and you can start this. Thank you. So, um, next. So this morning, I want to cover um, a little, share a little information about our STD clinic here in Portland, and share information about how our process works through the STD clinic to bill third-party insurers. And hopefully, you can understand some of the pros and cons to third-party medical billing, and also have an opportunity to ask some questions about 
third-party billing and how you may implement that in your program. Okay, next. Okay. So at our STD clinic, it's a comprehensive STD clinic. We offer testing, diagnosis, and treatment of chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. We also provide HIV testing and linkage to care. And we have an on-site stat laboratory. Next. Um, we also offer some limited vaccination services for hepatitis A, B, and HPV. We offer hepatitis C testing to injection drug users, and we offer some limited contraceptive services. And we have five disease intervention specialists that are integrated into our clinic. And even though we're not a family planning clinic, we do provide emergency contraception and some limited supply. Okay, next. So as you'll see on the slide, um, this kind of gives a picture of how many visits we see per year and a little bit of the demographic information. In our program, the mission is to promote policies that positively impact physical and sexual health and implement effective population-based public health interventions by prioritizing populations that experience the greatest disparities and engage with community partners. Next. So when clients come into our clinic, we ask them to complete a demographic form that asks for their name, date of birth, gender, address, phone number, and then we also ask about insurance status and income. And this is kind of the breakdown of where um, what people are reporting for their annual gross income and household size. So you can see that the majority of our clients are considered low income. Next. And this slide kind of gives a breakdown of our payer mix as far as about 90% of our clients report that they are uninsured. And we've been billing at Multnomah County Health Department since the 1980s, including charging for services on a sliding fee scale. We have a minimum fee of $20 and the capacity to bill most insurances. So the typical payer mix is self-pay, meaning client doesn't have insurance or chooses not to bill their insurance. Medicaid, which in Oregon is typically called Care Oregon or Oregon Health Plan, and we can bill private insurances as well as Medicare. We also, for self-pay clients, accept credit and debit cards, um, and clients can mail in a payment if they're not able to pay in full. And we also accept donations for clients that um, receive services at some of our community-based sites. Next. Serene, I'm just going to jump in for just a moment because I, I do hear a bit of background noise. For those folks who, who may have joined midstream, if you could press star six to mute your line, that way we won't have any background noise. Thank you. So our um, clinic is funded in various ways, and self-pay and third-party payment are our only a few ways that we receive funding. We also receive a large amount of money from the county general fund through Multnomah County. We receive some small grants from the state to provide DIS services. Um, we receive some funding for HIV prevention funds for HIV testing. We participate in some research studies, and we also receive state support from public health. Now, in, fiscal, in the past fiscal year, fiscal year 2012, we billed $176,553 to third-party payers, and out of that, we were reimbursed $56,424. And for clients, for self-pay clients that were charged on the sliding fee scale, we charged clients a total of $895,486, and out of that, we were able to collect $108,304 in self-pay revenue. And our total operating budget is a little over $2 million. So as you can see, the total amount that we receive in self-pay and third party isn't a lot of our total funding, but it does help support to continue services. Okay, hmm. next. So this is just a um, visual of how our health department is organized. So our health department director is Lillian Shirley, and under her is what we call community health services, so more the traditional core public health services, which our program is a part of. 
And then our program has seven primary care clinics, which are considered primary care federally qualified health centers, or FQAC, which the STD clinic is not a part of. And then we have a large infrastructure of operations, our health officer, health and social justice, business services, and HR that support both public health core services as well as our seven primary care clinics. And through that, we're able to benefit from this infrastructure, which supports our medical billing and also helps to pay for our epic practice management, which we don't have electronic health record yet, but we do use it for registration, appointment scheduling, and also allows us to bill. Okay, next. Okay. I just want to walk through uh, what a client would experience and how um, the billing process works at the Multnomah County STD Clinic. So, and this visual kind of gives a quick demonstration of that. So the client phones in or walks in for an appointment and the client is given information at that time about the minimum payment and also information about payment is available on our website and that's how most people find us is by Googling us. And the client, when they come in for the appointment, completes a demographic form which is available in the billing guide that NCSD um, provided. And a client, um, if they desire to bill their insurance, we collect a copy of their insurance card at the time of check-in. And that information gets entered into our EPIC practice management. And during the check-in process, the client receives information about our mission, what to expect today, and about fees. And then the client goes back to see the provider, and they may receive additional information about fees for Clients that are low risk, what we would consider um, 30 and older, um, not MSM, not having any symptoms, we would ask that the client pay for their chlamydia and gonorrhea NAT test at the time of their visit. So that's the, really the only time that we involve the provider in the fee or billing process. And then the client will check out. They submit an encounter form with the ICD-9 and CPT codes that the provider fills out. That information gets entered into our EPIC practice management system, and the patient makes a payment at checkout. So for clients that are billing their insurance, we'll collect a copay. If clients are billing Medicaid, um, we will not charge the client anything. We'll just bill their insurance. And for clients that have Medicare, again, we, there's no copay. We'll just bill their insurance. And then the charges go into a work queue automatically where they're reviewed for any errors. And the county contracts with a clearinghouse called Gateway to scrub or to look for any errors that may prevent a claim from not going through. And again, that's an example of how we're benefiting from the health department infrastructure. And then when an re reimbursement is received, it's applied to our program's cost center. So the reimbursement goes directly back into our program budget. Next. Okay. So um, typically on a quarterly basis, we'll request a report of reasons why claims weren't paid. And many, oftentimes, you know, as you can, as I mentioned earlier about how much money we are reimbursed, a lot of claims aren't covered for STD clinical services, you know, a little bit under half aren't, but um, these are some examples of why claims would be rejected or denied. So for example, coverage was not in effect on the date of service. So that's something that we don't have a lot of control over, but maybe a client just wasn't covered at that time. Um, benefit maximum has been reached, so meaning that they, their total cost that the insurer was going to cover in that year had already been passed. Um, out of network provider, again, if it's a insurer where we have to be part of their group, won't be covered, a non-covered service. Some insurers won't cover screening services. Um, payment made to the responsible party. So this is one that we um, accidentally found out about where clients that had Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield were, instead of the insurer reimbursing the clinic, they were actually sending checks to the clients. And so this had been going on for years where clients were receiving a check for $150 for coming in and getting tested. And then we only found out recently that the reason was because our providers weren't credentialed with Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. 
And credentialing is a process where you have to fill out a lot of paperwork in order to get covered and it goes through work history and any verifying licensure and all of that. So um, now our providers are credentialed with Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield and now we're receiving the checks. Um, benefit maximum has been reached, deductible not met, invalid diagnosis or lax info for claim processing. So those are just some examples of why claims may not be covered or paid. Okay, next. Okay, so some of the benefits of medical billing are increased revenue. Again, you know, a little bit, we're collecting almost $200,000 in revenue from self-paid clients and third-party billing, which is several positions for a small program like ours. So it's really important to keep that revenue stream going and to have diversified ways of receiving revenue. And we're also now, as Oregon is, planning to participate in the insurance exchange and expanding Medicaid, we are now able to demonstrate to people who are participating in healthcare transformation in Oregon that we do have Medicaid clients and so when we do move into a global budget, we will be able to request payment for those clients that we're seeing. Um, it allows us to develop relationships that you may not have had in the past with third party payers. And also it demonstrates to county leadership, commissioners, department leadership, and other funders that we've explored all of our options to continue our services. Okay, next. So some of the challenges that we've experienced um, through our system at the health department is that, first of all, um, we really benefit from that infrastructure, and so we're grateful for that, but it also has some challenges since we see about 8,000 clients a year and the FQHC within our own health department sees tens of thousands of clients a year. So sometimes we're a little bit ignored and lost in the shuffle. For example, in October 1st of this year, the ICD-9 codes changed and our internal use codes weren't changed over whereas the rest of the health department was. So that we had to put in a request to change and update our codes and so that, that's still in the process, and so we have several claims that we weren't able to send out because of that. Um, and the rules and codes change on an annual basis, so it's really important to keep on top of that and make sure that you're billing appropriately. And it's also important to have all your team members on the same page about messaging and billing and client fees, because we have struggled with that work. Some clinicians have felt that we shouldn't be charging for services and so then there's been this contradiction of information from what they receive at the front desk to and then what they receive when they're called back. So it's just really important to have that reminder about why we're all doing this. And since we're not part of the FQHC, our Medicaid reimbursement is slightly lower. And as I mentioned before that sometimes the health department doesn't have time to dedicate to our program compared to the other clinics. Okay, next slide. And so as part of continuous quality improvement, um, we continue to look at our messaging and make sure that everyone is on the same page as far as providing consistent messaging to the clients so that it's not confusing to them about why we're asking for their income information, why are we collecting their insurance information, and really clearly explaining it to our clients. Um, we also, on a regular basis, review our self-pay and third-party revenue to make sure that we're on target for what we had forecasted for revenue collection. We quarterly review the denial reports to see if there's anything systematic that we can change to help increase our reimbursement. And we also have an annual update from our medical billing specialist to talk to our office assistants and front desk checkout staff so that, again, they're providing the, and have the most up-to-date information. Next. So thank you for your participation. I hope that was helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Shireen. And now we'll move from the Multnomah County STD Clinic to the Philadelphia High School STD Screening Program. Yes. We'll hear first from uh, Melinda Salmon, who has worked with the Philadelphia STD Control Program since 2002. First as the assistant program manager and later as the program manager. 
She was mentored and trained by Marty Goldberg, who has been the STD program manager in Philadelphia for many years. Prior to working in Philadelphia, Melinda worked in Atlanta in CDC's Division of Diabetes Translation, and prior to that, she was a program manager for Philadelphia's Tuberculosis Control Program. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melinda. Thank you, Ariana. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, first, I'm just going to give a little background about Philadelphia's high school screening program. Uh, this program has been going on uh, in Philadelphia since uh, January of 2003, and um, we have provided our program in Philadelphia public high schools for every school year since uh, January 2003. Um, we provide educational information to uh, high school students, and there are about 40,000 high school students in the Philadelphia Public High School school system. And after we provide the educational information to the students, we also offer voluntary and confidential urine-based testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, in addition to offering our screening, we also provide treatment for anyone who tests positive partner services for those who test positive, and rescreening for positives uh, approximately three to four months after their treatment. And this is all done um, in the high school setting. Okay, next slide. So the rationale for third-party billing, um, back when we started our high school STD screening program, uh, we had a case rate among Philadelphia adolescent females that hovered very close to 10,000 per 100,000 population. Uh, with a case rate at such epidemic proportions, we knew we had to initiate a broad-based screening, screening and treatment program in order to prevent the serious complications. Uh, but we knew, however, that screening several thousand uh, adolescents each year was going to be very expensive to our program and um, possibly not feasible. Therefore, uh, we began exploring the possibility of doing third-party billing. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So a little bit about our budget. We estimate that our high school STD screening program uh, with the personnel and supplies and laboratory testing costs approximately a million dollars each year. Um, at this time, approximately 15 to 20 percent um, of that cost we get reimbursed through billing these third-party payers. And since we've been uh, billing the Medicaid managed care organizations, you can see that they have provided uh, a little bit over $1 million in reimbursements to the STD control program. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, and I'm not sure if this varies from state to state, uh, but we bill only for the test. And the test reimbursement, we use a dual gonorrhea and chlamydia urine-based test. Um, the total reimbursement for the test is $46 for each person tested. Okay, next slide. So we began to uh, initiate I'm sorry, the year after we initiated our high school STD program, STD screening program, we began looking at the possibility of billing the Medicaid managed care providers. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have a commissioner of health who had developed a very strong relationship with the Medicaid managed care organizations. Uh, and what we decided was that, um, or what was decided is that this was really a win-win situation that we could bill, the SCD control program could bill and get reimbursements for the test and use that money to put back in to the screening program to ensure it was sustainable. And then the Medicaid managed care organizations could count the test towards their HEDIS measure. And um, if you're not familiar with HEDIS measure, uh, HEDIS stands for Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. And this is a tool that is used by over 90% of health plans to measure performance. 
And the exact HEDIS measure that pertains to chlamydia screening is the proportion of sexually active females between the ages of 15 and 25 who are screened for a chlamydia test, who are screened for chlamydia annually. So the HEDIS measure is a way that okay. um, consumers can compare different health plans um, in their performance and their support of these uh, measures. Okay, next slide. Um, initially, we had been told that uh, by the school district that about half of the students were covered under these Medicaid managed care plans. Um, and we decided to capitalize on a relationship that we already had through our IPP program um, to work with the Family Planning Council. They already had experience with billing. And they had access to the Medicaid managed care organization's roster. So they would be able to verify uh, who was covered by which plan on which date. Um, the best thing is that, uh, of course, it doesn't require that this, the student pay anything. And the student doesn't actually even have to know what plan they are covered under in order for us to bill. Um, in addition, because this is billed as a family planning service, no statement of benefits is sent home. And I believe, um, and Darren Eichner will be speaking on this later, that this is a carve out that had been agreed upon that a statement of benefits for family planning services would not be sent uh, to guardians. So um, there was no concern about a violation of confidentiality. Okay, next slide. So how we get the information is that during uh, the portion of our screening program, when we are offered testing, every student must fill out uh, a demographic sheet. And this includes simple things such as name, address, telephone number, date of birth. And of course, we, we tell the students, for those who test, we need all this information to submit their laboratory specimen. And for the other students, we say, even if you're not going to test, it's very important that you include this information so that we can ensure confidentiality. In other words, every student has to go through the same process, and it's not until they are in the privacy of the stall in the bathroom that they decide whether or not they're going to test. But no one will know that as long as everyone is going through the same process. Um, on the back of the demographic sheet that the student fills out, uh, there's a very simple statement that allows us and gives consent for us to build their Medicaid managed care plan. Um, and it basically says, I'm just going to read it slowly, I understand that my testing and test results are confidential and will not be given to anyone else. By signing below, I agree to allow the health department to let my health choices plan know I was tested so that the cost of testing can be shared. Test results will not be shared. And it also says, I understand I can still be tested if I don't sign this form. So um, no one has to sign the back of the form, uh, but we request that the students do. And what we found is that when we ask the students to sign, about 75% of them do sign the back of the form. Okay, next slide. Uh, we enter all the data into our surveillance date database, and we have to do this anyway because students call for test results, and so we have to be able to quickly look up their test results and give them to them over the phone. Um, so we ensure that the, test, the, the demographic information is entered in a timely manner. Uh, we have also designated a specific field to indicate whether or not the student consented to the billing. So if they sign the back of the form consenting, uh, we fill out a specific field with just a Y for yes. Um, and then usually about uh, a week after the end of the month, we extract the data fields that are necessary for the Family Planning Council to run that against the Medicaid managed care rosters. And of course, we only extract, extract the names of those students who consented to have their plans billed. Um, once the data is extracted, we upload it to a secure FTP, and then the, family, the staff at the Family Planning Council can get to the data and run it against their uh, rosters. Okay, next slide. 
just some important points before I turn the presentation over to Darren. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. Uh, we are able to ensure confidentiality because uh, this is a, built as a family planning test, and therefore no statement of benefits is sent home. Um, we only bill for the test and not for treatment because we wouldn't want uh, information about who tests positive. Again, a confidentiality issue. So for every student, we are only billing for the test, not for the treatment. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Darren to add her perspective. Thank you so much, Melinda. And I'd like to introduce the next two speakers um, from the Family Planning Council, as Melinda mentioned, really key partners in the high school uh, STD screening program. Sarah Eichner is the Director of Service Improvement at the Family Planning Council in Philadelphia, where she provides oversight for quality improvement and training and performance improvement functions and is responsible for family planning, billing, and data management processes. She served as a faculty member at the Drexel University School of Public Health since 2006, facilitating classes that address behavioral assessment, community assessment, and program planning and evaluation. Previously, Ms. Eichner spent 14 years as a public health program manager and advisor with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in its STD, HIV, and immunization programs. She's joined by her colleague, Ellen Lustgarden, who is the former director of information systems at the Family Planning Council and has served in this role at the council for 20 years, now acting as a consultant to the council on various billing issues, including a project that Ellen is working on uh, with third-party billing for the Philadelphia STD Program's High School Screening Services. And with that, I'll turn that over to them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Ellen. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit, I guess we need to go to the next slide, about um, contracting and credentialing, and very little bit, because we really didn't have to go through a lot of credentialing when we first started this program. The council had had contracts with the Medicaid uh, managed care organizations here in Philadelphia for many years. We have the contract on behalf of the provider network. There's about 26 agencies representing around 90 clinic sites. But the contracts were held with, between the um, managed care plan and the council on behalf of all of those agencies, as opposed to separate con contractual arrangements with each agency. So when the STD program started its high school screening project, they were added as another agency in this contract. So uh, we enrolled their, the one medical director for the project into each, with each of the plans, so we didn't have to um, enroll each of the sites, at the school sites at which they would be providing the services, uh, one NPI number for that medical director. Um, and so it made it very simple. I'm not sure that at this point if we were to start over again, it would be this simple because credentialing has gotten very complicated. The um, contractual arrangement, again, is between the council and the MCOs, and then we have a contract with the health department, as Melinda described, to act as a billing agent on behalf of the, um, of the high school screening program and processing the data and submitting those bills and following up with them with the managed care plans. At this point, we don't bill our uh, fee-for-service Medicaid. This is really the three Medicaid managed care plans in the Philadelphia area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what happens, as Melinda described, is that a, a file, a spreadsheet, is sent to the Council's F, uh, secure FTP site with minimal student information, basically the first name, last name, date of birth, and the date on which the screen occurred. That information is used to create a file that we send up to our Department of Public Welfare's Eligibility Verification System, EVS. Then we get information back from that system that tells us whether or not the student has coverage, and if so, under which plan they are covered and what their member identifier is in that plan. And that's the information that we then use to bill the plans that month. This is done on a monthly basis. Um, we create billing files. Uh, there used to be a, a HIPAA 837, now it's a 5010 format for those of you in the billing world. Those we bill, as Melinda said earlier, only the screens. There's no visits build, there's no counseling build, there's no treatment build. 
We built two CPT codes, one for the gonorrhea screen, one for the chlamydia screen. We built one uh, diagnosis code for an STD screen, and that's basically the, each of the files that get submitted. So it's, it's very minimal in terms of the data elements. Um, and as Melinda had indicated, the, each screen is reimbursed at $23.19 for a total of $46 and change for each student. Um, in the past, we had provided information for a third plan that the city was billing on its own, um, the same information, and the, and the STD program created its billing file for that plan. We will be taking over the billing of that plan in the same manner as the others. Um, the, we submit these files, these billing files, to a clearinghouse who then processes them and submits them to the various Medicaid managed care plans. The managed care plans hopefully pay all of those claims and submit and, and send the checks directly to the City of Philadelphia Finance Department, which I have to say, which I'm specifying because that can cause some confusion. Um, as you can imagine, the City of Philadelphia has a large amount of Medicaid billing, and sometimes the payments get lost in the, the Finance Department there because um, it's hard to separate out what the uh, service payments are for just the STD program, but we are actually working on that. Um, we follow up on the submissions to the clearinghouse to see what's not gotten through to the insurance plans, and then we follow up with the insurance plans to see what has not been paid to the health department. Um, some things to look out for, what we've experienced is that the plans sometimes have a hard time understanding family planning as a carve out, and then when you throw the STD program as part of a family planning program onto that, they really get lost as to how this works. Um, so having a good contact person at the MCO is really important. Um, and the other issue that I just brought up is that being able to differentiate the payment for the program, for the STD program, separate from all of the other billing that happens at the city health department is also a challenge that we continue to work on. Um, that's pretty much how it works. I don't know what else I can add for you. Hi, this is Darren, and I just wanted to add um, just two things. One, I did want to confirm what uh, Melinda had said earlier about the EOBs. That is part of our arrangements with uh, all the MCOs, that EOBs are not sent out for any of our clients. That's throughout the family planning system as well as the um, S high school screening program. And you know, it's hard when you do webinars because you have such a, a, a vast difference potentially in knowledge. I just wanted to say one word, to, to know what people know and don't know, and I just wanted to say one word about what a clearinghouse was. I've done this talk a couple of times, and while you, you may know, a clearinghouse is essentially um, a, an agency that you submit your data to, your files to, and they will create for each payer a HIPAA-compliant claim that the payer will accept. And each payer has Many payers have a favorite clearinghouse that they use, so you have to make sure that you choose your clearinghouses based on the payers in your area. And that's all I have to say. So I guess I will throw it back to you, Ariana. Great. Thank you all so much. So um, we'll go ahead and move into the uh, question and answer session. And we've been gathering some questions throughout. Um, for those of you who may have joined midstream, we are collecting questions uh, through the chat function. So you can submit those, and, and we um, will share those. Uh, so we won't be doing a, a verbal Q&A. Um, so if you have any additional questions, feel free to submit those, and, and I'll be reading those for our presenters to share. The first question I have is um, for, the, uh, for Shireen from um, Multnomah County STD Clinic. Mm -hmm. And um, one was um, around the issue of confidentiality. Does, um, do any of the clients have any concerns about confidentiality or EOBs? Um, and the other is if you could just repeat um, the amount uh, uh, that was charged and the amount received back as a reimbursement. Yes, definitely when clients um, go through the registration process, they meet one-on-one -on -one with an office assistant who explains if someone is planning to bill their private insurance or Medicare, a client will receive an explanation of benefits. And the details that are provided on the explanation of benefits, which is basically something saying, that is mailed from the insurer to the client saying that their insurance was charged 
offer and it explains what the services were. And sometimes it'll just be office visit and laboratory service. And other insurance will provide a little bit more information. And it also explains how much was charged and how much was covered and what the patient's responsibility is. And so we kind of talk through that with clients and see, like, you know, would someone open their mail? How comfortable do they feel receiving that? And oftentimes it doesn't provide a lot of details except that it was an office visit and laboratory results. Um, for Medicaid, um, similar to what the other speakers were talking about, they won't send an explanation of benefits. So our Care Oregon clients, Oregon Health Plan clients, won't receive an explanation of benefits. Um, and I can repeat the dollar amount for how much in a sec. So last fiscal year, we billed $176,553 to third-party payers, and we received $56,424. And in self-pay revenue, we received $108,304, and we provided about $900,000 worth of services to those clients. Great, thank you. The next question I have is um, for both sites, and it's about who the medical providers um, in the clinic and the program are. Um, this particular uh, person who submitted the question wrote that their clinic provides testing by nurses under a physician's standing order, and wonders about the capability to bill because nurses are providing the exam services, pelvic exams for NAATS, sweat preps, and gram stains. So if you could talk a little bit about who are the providers and um, how that arrangement works. That, that's why our program has chosen to um, have nurse practitioners. We have three full-time nurse practitioners and one physician assistant, so all mid-level providers providing services to the clients so that we can charge for the visit. We also have another type of visit called a just checking visit for asymptomatic screening, and that's provided by a non-licensed staff person. So through that program, we cannot bill any of the managed care organizations or Medicaid, Medicare, private insurers because it is a non-licensed personnel. And um, yeah, we strategically chose not to hire any nurses to provide services because of that problem where you can't bill. And this is uh, this is Melinda. Hi. Um, we ever all billing the credentialed person for the STD control program is uh, the STD medical director for the program. And again, all billing is done under her um, and um, under her credentialing, and then the testing is done uh, by standing order under her instruction. Right, and it's part of our carve out agreements with the MCOs in in um, Philadelphia. We do bill all of the services under the medical director. I would imagine moving forward that is something that we will change over time because of um, you know the new requirements that are coming under ACA and the ability for other people to bill. So that's that's a process I'm sure that's going to have to change in the future. Thank you. We also had a question about what type of system do you have available to find out the type of insurance plan that a particular student has for the um, high school screening program? Right. The, the system is really one that's operated by our Department of Public Welfare, and it's a system by which uh, we can just send to them. It's a lookup. We can, you can either do it manually, uh, patient by patient, or you can send them a file of the patient's first name, last name, date of birth, and date of service, and get a file back, which is what we do, that indicates whether they had coverage on the date of service, and if so, what coverage. It's not our system. Um, in the past, we had used to receive um, monthly rosters from each of the plans that indicated the, uh, who, who their membership was and what their um, begin date and end date of membership was. And we would use those to match against the clients who had been screened to see whether they were eligible for coverage. And in Portland, we're using the Medicaid Management Information System, also known as MIMIS, which is like an online system where we can verify eligibility. Thank you. Another uh, participant asks if you could speak if from both sides, speak a little bit more about the credentialing process. Uh, well, this is Melinda, and I probably would be best. There's, I think there's just 
I'm sorry, my medical director isn't here. I think there's just a lot of questions that have to be answered about administrative items, you know, um, and sort of gathering of provider number and things like that. Um, I know it's a very tedious, not necessarily hard, but more of a tedious process. And I don't know, um, Ellen or Darren, if you could talk more about that. Right. I, I don't know that much about it either, Melinda, but I do, they do ask, as you say, for education, licensure, um, uh, uh, specialty practice, whether, you know, whether you're a GYN or a primary care physician. Um, so essentially what you'd have to do is each payer will have a specific um, field, a number of fields of information that they require for credentialing. One of the best advice I think we can give people if you're going to credential people is to start with, you know, uh, your Department of Public Welfare or your medical assistance programs um, because in Philadelphia, for example, once we get that credentialing down there, then all the MCOs, which are pretty much extensions of that program, the credentialing, we had all the information we needed to submit to them for the credentialing uh, process. There's also a number of websites that you can use um, that I'm sorry I don't have in front of me at the computer. Um, where that is a, a centralized kind of national um, li library is not the right word. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, a database. There we go. A na <laughs> national database of uh, credentialing activities, and I'm sure we can get you that information after the webinar. Thank you. We had a question for both sites actually about which labs you sub you use. Um, if you could speak about what kind of relationship you have um, with the lab and how that impacts billing. Well, this is Melinda. We submit all of our specimens to our public health laboratory. Um, and uh, uh, it, so it doesn't really impact billing. We're able to get all test results from there. And in return, we do um, support laboratory testing through uh, a number of laboratory staff. And um, we buy test kits for the laboratory. This is Shireen. So in Oregon, we use um, the majority of our specimens are sent to the Oregon State Public Health Lab, but we also um, work with Quest Diagnostics, which is a private lab. And the labs invoice our program directly, and so we pay for the lab cost, and we charge insurance companies so that the labs are included as part of the claim, but we don't always necessarily get reimbursed for them. We had another question for the Philadelphia um, High School Screening Program about whether the school clinics are run by physicians or nurse practitioners. Um, well, there's not clinics in the schools. I mean, every school has a nurse, but especially recently, um, these nurses have been cut back dramatically. So even in the largest school, there may be only one nurse and maybe only one nurse three days a week. But our, our program is completely separate from uh, the, the school program, and that's for confidentiality reasons as well as sort of just practical reasons. They have so much to do because they're so understaffed, they cannot really be involved in our STD screening program. Um, so they are not really a part of what we do. And I think, uh, I don't know if they have nurse practitioners or just school nurses. Thank you. We had a, a question for both sites about um, the kind of costs associated with using a clearinghouse. Ooh. Oh. Mm. We don't know. Yeah, we're I sitting here saying, ooh, this is uh, Philadelphia. I, I know we have a contract with the clearinghouse, and, and unfortunately I don't know that number off the top of my head. But again, you know, um, I can get that information. Yeah, and I don't, this is Shireen again. I. I don't know exactly either. To me, it seemed like it was a percentage of the claim, but I, I can't remember, but I can get that for you guys too. And, and we've had a couple of questions about um, both um, about coding and um, particularly folks that are um, new to coding and kind of how that works in relationship to billing. So um, one person has asked about the kinds of codes that are used, which code ICD-9 codes you use. Another person has asked, um, that, or said that their understanding is that ICD-10 codes will be universal, but um, are not currently, and asks um, if the CPT codes and diagnostic codes 
are state specific or national. So maybe you could just talk a little bit globally about the relationship to coding. Um, obviously, this is not uh, a technical training on how to code, but um, just to give an overview for those folks that, that may not be as familiar with coding. So this is Darren in Philadelphia, and the first thing I want to say is that whenever I talk to people about coding in the family planning or the STD clinic world, I want to assure you those numbers about the thousands and thousands of CPT codes that you see out there, you do not use most of them. Because we have to remember that we provide, for the most part, a limited set of services in both family planning and STD clinics, and so it's really only a small number of codes that um, um, that you can easily you know, put together in cheat sheets and, and, and handouts for people to, to help them, or on your super bills, rather, to help people figure out what the codes are. Certainly, you're, we're currently using uh, ICD-9 codes because the implementation to ICD-10 codes has been delayed. Um, that will be another transition that we'll have to do over the next year, but we're currently using ICD-9. I forgot the other two questions. Did you I don't know whether the request was for the specific codes being used. We use, um, again, because we're just billing for the lab test, we, we use uh, two, a CPT code for chlamydia screening, which is 87491, and a CPT code for gonorrhea screening, which is 87591. I believe these are national CPT codes. Right. Though I will say that every once in a while, a third party pair will have some kind of special uh, agreement in their um, Companion guides. The companion guide is actually the, the billing guide that each of the pairs will put out that will give you instructions on how to bill them. Um, you know, the only example, of course, that comes to mind right now is not really related to uh, STDs, but it has to do with a family planning code that uh, we use specifically to indicate, you know, a fifth depot shot within one calendar year. That is probably not a universal code. The other thing I would like to do is to draw your attention to the guide that NCSD just did put together and I think is available on their, their website around shifting to third party billing practices. It's, it's, you know, I think it's, a, it's the case study guide that Bill and Ariana were talking about. And in that guide, you will see example of super bills that give you the current CPT codes and the diagnosis codes um, that um, are a good sample and I think the majority of codes that you'll encounter when you're working in an STD or STD clinic setting. Great. Thank you for making that referral, Darren. Um, sure. And then uh, the next question is for Shireen. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, asking if you could elaborate on how the Multnomah County STD clinic's ability to bill Medicaid physicians do well as Oregon implements health care reform. So what kind of impact um, does that have in terms of how you'll be able to respond to health care reform? So as, as Oregon moves towards health care transformation, we've been asked to provide the number of clients that we've seen um, that ha currently have Medicaid. And my understanding is that that will be a starting point for how much we'll receive as part of the global budget. And then as we continue to see more and more clients that have Medicaid, there's a potential there that we can receive more money because my understanding is how it's going to work is with the global budget, rather than billing fee for service for each client that comes in, we're going to send out a claim, we're going to receive a lump sum for the number of clients that we currently serve. And then as more and more people receive coverage, if they're receiving services from us, then we can report that out to the organization, the group of people that are monitoring the global budget. So that's still emerging. We, you know, haven't, that hasn't been fully implemented, but moving towards 2014, that's what we're looking at. Thank you. We have another question that um, is directed at both sites, and um, this person is asking about how the revenue generated through third-party billing um, has impacted or changed the award amounts that you've received from grants or governments uh, or other kinds of funding streams? So, um, this is Shireen, sorry. Um, so, yes, we do, as part of our STD grant, we don't receive any direct CDC funds for STD clinical services, but through the small state STD grant that we receive, 
directly from the Oregon Health Authority, we do report to them how much income we receive from self-pay clients and from insurers. Um, but again, it's a very small grant, so it hasn't impacted that grant per se. Um, we did have to make an agreement with the um, state public health authority that um, we would not refuse services for clients that tested positive or that were contacts to chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, or HIV, um, even though we do charge, and that has been worked into our program element, that we can charge up to $20 for DIS clients, but we've, we've made an agreement that we wouldn't refuse service or treatment to any of those clients. Thank you. This question is for the Philadelphia High School Screening Program. How do you address health literacy issues and language barriers for students? Okay. Hi, this is Melinda. Um, I, just to answer the other question that was before, we um, about whether or not funds coming in have affected our awards. Um, as we have to report, because the the funds that we get reimbursed were, are generated at least somewhat by staff that are funded from our federal grant. We have to report those funds as program income, and we do have to request from CDC uh, to spend that money. So they have to have a detailed account of how we're going to spend it. So at this point, all the money has gone directly back into the high school screening program. It has not reduced our award at all. Um, but we do, because it is generated through the use of, at least to some degree, from CDC funds, um, we do have to ask them when we want to spend it. Um, and the health literacy. So, um, I mean, the presentation that we do to the students is extremely basic. Um, and, you know, we try to break it down as much as possible. If there are language barriers, we do have people on our staff that speak a lot of different languages, but we also try to engage, if there are translators at the school, we try to engage them as well. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Thank you. There was also, um, I think this will be our last question, there was a, um, a question about how the carve-out um, around EOBs came about. If you could talk a little bit about the history there in Philadelphia. Wow. I think it's universal. Right. Uh, yeah, Darren and I are trying to figure out the answer to that question. I don't know if that's just Philadelphia or whether that is federally mandated, but I don't know the answer to that, about how that happened. It happened so long ago I either never knew or I don't remember. Let's do one more question then, and this one is a bit um, open-ended. Um, just asking for advice that you might offer uh, for uh, third-party billing practices when most patients are not enrolled in Medicaid. So is there anything different to consider um, based on the kind of um, health insurance coverage of the population you're serving? So I guess I would find out what are the major insurance companies that clients have, and you may want to get credentialed with those top three or four. If the majority of your clients have private insurance. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we will wrap up. On behalf of NCSD and our presenters, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for shifting to third-party billing practices for public health STD services focused on case studies part one. As we've mentioned um, throughout the uh, webinar today, um, the um, complete guide that NCSD um, developed around third-party billing questions um, is available that we um, highlighted case studies from these two sites, uh, as well as other additional resources that, uh, that we've mentioned throughout the, the webinar today. You will receive a follow-up message with details on accessing the slides from today's presentation as well as the audio recording. And this now concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.